right, we're going to change direction a little bit for Chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start talking about uh, 2.1 anyway, numeration systems. Um, parts of Chapter 2 are going to look familiar if you've had contemporary math recently. Um, and the first part of this is probably one of those pieces that will have some familiarity to you. So to take a look to start with, is everybody good with the board? You're good? Okay. Um, we're going to start talking about, well, this actually this slide talks about our numeration system. The Hindu-Arabic numeration system is what we use today. Okay. So you can go and impress somebody at lunch or dinner tonight or whatever and tell them you know all about the Hindu Aramaic number system, right? And they're going to be very impressed until you tell them it's what they want to. So um, the properties, a couple properties, is that we have our numerals are constructed from ten digits. What are those ten digits? Zero through nine, right? to realize that there is no numeral 10 in the base 10 number system, number system. There's a number we call 10, but it actually takes two digits. A numeral is one digit. Do you guys see the difference between that? So when I talk about a numeral, I'm talking about one single digit. Um, and our system is also a place value system. So it's based on powers of 10. So we have our tens place, we have our hundreds place, we have our ones place, but they're all bases that have tens in them. So for instance, if we take a look, I'll start over here with our ones place, and we call this our tens place. We call this our hundreds place, but I can actually write the number 100 as a base of 10 with a power of 2. So that's what it, that's why we call it the base 10 number system, is because all of the place values can be written as a power of 10. Uh, and we can keep going, right? We have the thousands place, and do you know what power of 10 it is? 3. We'll go one further. We have the ten thousands place. What power of 10 is it? Four. And one quick way to get in your mind how many place value is it is you can count the zeros. The power is actually equivalent to the number of zeros in it. So this is 10,000 and there's four zeros, we have a power of four. Now if we think about that, that would, and in that way, then the number 10 would be 10 to the power of one. And what would the number one be? It's zero for lots of reasons, right? But 10 to the power of zero actually equals the number one. Um, Remember, of course, that powers um, simply have this feature where they're repeated multiplication. Okay, so that's what we're using when we work with powers. This actually, the way it's written, would be n times down here. All right, so this is what we use today. But it didn't just appear from the sky out of nowhere. There was a lot of different number systems that led up to what we use today. And we're going to talk about a few of them. Um, and this is the part that's going to feel like you've seen pieces of this before if you've taken contemporary math. So we're going to do the Egyptian numeration system first. The Egyptians are the ones who do the hieroglyphics, right? So you may have seen in them in other references and other history courses. Uh, they have a numeration system, a number system, uh, that has those same kind of symbols. They've got pictures for everything. Now some of their pictures are very basic and others are a little more complicated. Um, the numerous, the numeral, excuse me, for the first digit that they have actually just looks like our number one. Okay, this is something called a vertical stack. And it has a value of the number one as well. So that's handy, right? It looks just like what we use. Or what you would use in a tally system or something like that. The second numeral, however, doesn't look like anything we really have in our numeration system. It's like an upside down U, or they refer to it as a heel bone. At the back of your here, the heel can kind of picture that image there. Um, we use that symbol also when we do intersections of things. You might have seen that when we do, um, you've, done, if you've done sets of stuff before. Um, this heel bone actually has a value of 10. So if you see a heel bone in their system, they're talking about the number 10 in our system. The next one they have is a scroll. And most of the resources that I see have drawn the scroll to look something like that, almost like a nine with an extra little loop going on. Uh, but there are a few resources, too, that draw backwards, and apparently it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the orientation, if you will, of the image is just not important. Um, in some sense, it sort of reminds me of what happens like, uh, in Ethiopia, where our daughter is, right? Um, changing things into English, they don't worry so much about the spelling. And so right now, I have three spellings of my daughter's last name. That's not real helpful if I'm trying to apply or look at something for a legal piece of paperwork, right? But they have the same sort of thing going on. The orientation of this is not so very clear. Um, this scroll has a value of 100. All 
All right, the lotus flower is next. There's different images for how this one looks, too. I'm going to draw you one of them, and I think this one comes from our book. I'll say it does. It's not perfect. I'm not an artist. Uh, but it looks something like this. Can you imagine a drooping down flower? This is your lotus flower. Um, and just if you had to sort of speculate or guess, what do you think its value is? A thousand. Yes, it is. The pointing finger sounds like a simple enough drawing. Um, it looks something like that. You can kind of imagine something going like this with a finger, right? Um, it, it, again, I don't draw very well. You should think I could draw this one, but um, I don't draw it very well either. So if you want to reference your book for their image, please do. How much do you think this one's worth? 10,000 is correct. So what's happening to the values in their system over here on the right? Yeah, they're, they're base 10 values, right? They're doing it the same kind of way we are, and they're going to construct it in a little bit different way, but they're the same base 10 kind of a kind of a base 10 system that we do. But they don't have place value systems, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, this next, next one, your book calls it a polylog or a verbo, um, and the, I think the contemporary math book calls it a fish or a whale. Does that sound right? I see not. Um, it looks something like this. picture Jonah, he's inside that whale. Okay, um, and he has the value what? 100,000, that's right. Uh, the last one is an astonished man, and this one actually does get drawn differently in uh, the contemporary math book versus our book. Let me just show you what both of them look like, and I don't care how you draw them, but um, this book shows it like this. And the contemporary math book shows it like this. Either way, I think he's very excited because it's worth a million. This would take your favorite drawing, make the man look excited. Don't draw a stick figure, that's not appropriate since neither of those pictures look like a stick figure. They don't look like great figures, but they're on stick figure. Okay? So here are our two sort of images for that astonished man. All right, we're going to take a look um, at what we're going to do with this number system next. All right, so we're going to consider a value. The value we're going to consider is going to look like this. In this class, with maybe just like two exceptions in your homework, your focus is not going to be on taking our number and putting it into their system, or taking their number and putting it back into our system. I know you did that in contemporary math. Again, I'm sort of harping on contemporary math because that's where this is pulled from. And that, that's great. It's just a different focus on the systems in this class. What we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on what happens if you were an Egyptian and you're wanting to know what number comes before this and what number comes after this. How can I look at two numbers and decide which one is bigger? That kind of a thing. Okay? So, in, both, in most of these cases, when we're looking at the numeral after and the numeral before, one of them is very quick and easy, and the other one usually requires you to think just a little bit to figure out what they would have done. Can you tell which one's easy in this case, the after or the before? The after is easy. So, the number that would come after our numbers, we just increase it by one, right? Same thing in their system. So, the number that comes after this one, if we increased it by one, what would I have to do? Just add that vertical staff on the end. Okay, that's all I have to do. So the number that comes after this value, part B, would look like the two, sorry, the three scrolls, a heel bone, and then a vertical staff. That's the easy one. However, the number that comes before requires you to stop and think a little bit, right? Because there's not a staff to take away. So what would I have to do? Any thoughts? Right, so a heel bone, how much Taylor is a heel bone worth? This is worth 10. So you do have to be a little careful when you're doing this to make sure that whatever's coming last really has the, the one more place value, right? Uh, for instance, if that heel bone weren't there, we wouldn't be able to turn the scroll into nine of these guys, right? So it does matter if you're careful on that count. But that heel bone is worth 10. 
So if I want one less than that, and so to kill them, what am I going to have? What do you think? Do a guess, Audrey? Sure. So what I want to do is I want the number to be one less than whatever this is right now. We can talk about what it is right now, but that's not really the point. We've actually identified that, that last value, that heel bone, is worth the number 10. All right? So we need a value that's actually going to be worth the number 9. How would we get 9 in their number system using these numerals? We'd have to use 9 staffs. That's our only option. Are you with me? So we're sort of going to trade. We're going to, what we're really doing is we're trading that heel bone in for 10 of something, 10 staffs. But then we're taking one of those staffs away. Imagine this is what you do with money, right? Say you owed somebody ten dollars, what would they do? And, and we only had tens and ones, we have five dollar bills. Well, you give them the ten and they'd give you back nine one dollar bills. That's what we're doing here. We're exchanging that heel bone, which is worth ten, for, for nine of our staffs. So the three at the beginning don't change. And then we have nine staffs. Don't be tempted to sort of hash them off. We don't have any tally system here. We don't get to do that. Sometimes you will see them written um, like this, where they stack them on top of each other when they get to be lengthy, you know, more than about six or seven, some of that. I don't care whether you stack them or not, either way it's fine with me, but if you see them stacked, it doesn't mean anything different. All right, so the value of an A does not seem to be an especially efficient use of my time or the space on my table or the lead in my table. It requires me to write out more stuff, right? Um, and if we had not had that heel bone, it would have been even worse, right? So let's imagine that scroll. How much that scroll worth? A hundred. So let's imagine you have a hundred dollar bill and you owe somebody a dollar. What happens? Well, you have to turn the hundred dollar bill into tens, right? So then you have ten tens, and then you have to turn one of those tens into ten ones, and you can give them one dollar bill. So you have nine tens, and you have nine ones, which would mean I need to write nine heel bones and nine staffs. I don't like the number nine if I'm an Egyptian. It's not especially uh, convenient, right? Because you have to do repeated symbol operations. So this is sort of one of the drawbacks of this system, is that it just is cumbersome to write. It's lengthy. It's not difficult, right? I mean, like, we can write nine heel bones. We can write nine staffs. It's not hard. It's just kind of long, and the more nines we have in our system, in our mind, the longer it is to write their system out. So that's a drawback of their system. Next, we're going to look at the Babylonians. <clears throat> the Babylonians only have two different symbols. That's it. All right? So they have a symbol that looks like an upside-down triangle. Theirs are filled in. If you choose not to fill it in, I'm not going to complain too much. Um, that triangle or that upside down triangle actually has a value of one. And then they have a symbol that looks sort of like our less than symbol. It looks a little bit more bold than our less than symbol, but again, if, if you use right less than, that's okay. Um, and this one has a value of 10. But they don't just write those two symbols out like the Babylon or like the Egyptians did. Yes, right? Like what if you had the number 1,000? Are, are you really going to write out that many of those less than signs, right? Well, not in their system. They do use some repetition and values, but not quite like that. They actually have a place value system like we have a place value system, but their place value system has place value of 60. So in our system, we have the ones place, and then we have the tens place, right? Well, they have the ones place, and then they have the sixties place, and then they have the sixty squareds place, and they go on up from there, sixty cubed. So in our system, take a look and think with me. If you have the tens place right here, it means any of our numerals can go in that tens place, right? Zero through nine. Well, in their system, this 60s place right here, any numeral that's 59 and below can go in that place. And the way that I would get that number 59 or 46 or 22 is that I would use these symbols to get it. So if I wanted the number 32, let's use 32, I'd use three of the less thans, because that's 30, and then I'd use two of these triangles, and that would be the number 32. And we can put that inside of that place value right there. So that, that's what they would do. So they, they do use that repetition of symbols, but they only do it up to the number 59. 
So let me show you what happens when we take a look at looking at numbers before and after this. So here's the value we're going to consider. It's going to be long to write out. Mine actually went off the screen on my paper, so here's my two. I want you to do one triangle. I'm not going to fill mine in just for sake of space. Five less thans. And then nine triangles. One, five, and then nine. Okay, so in their number system, if they have a less than and they have these triangles, if those are both inside of a place value, the less than signs, the, five, the digits of the value 10, come before the triangle. So everything that I underlined in red would be considered all within that plate, first place value. And actually, it's the number 59, like I was talking about a minute ago, right? So you have five of the tens, and you have nine of the ones. This is the number 59. So you have a different place value when you get to here. And then in this place value, you have a number one. So this place value, this, this system actually is the number 160, and then 59 ones. So if we were working um, on trying to turn it into one of our numbers, that's how we would think of it. Yes, and it will always have, if it has the triangles and the less than signs, the less than, reading from left to right like we normally read, the less than will come before the triangle. Like for instance, we wouldn't do the grouping right here. Audrey. We wouldn't group these, these symbols together because this triangle is a smaller value than the less than, and the triangle would always come afterwards if they were supposed to be grouped together. Now, our goal, again, though, is simply to find out what number comes before and what number comes after something, right? So let's talk about the number that comes before. How could I type, take the number that comes before this? That's the easy one this time. Yeah, I just take away one of the triangles at the end. In other words, instead of having 58 at the end, we're going to have at 59 at the end, we'll have 58. We just take away a triangle. So that's the easy one to talk about. So we have the triangle at the beginning. I have the five signs that look like less thans. And then I have eight triangles. That's, that's the easy one, right? The next one's harder because we have to stop and think. What we'd like to do is simply add an extra triangle. Why can't I? Because that will make a number of greater than 59, right? It would give me 60. Okay. So this is the equivalent to what would happen in your wallet if you actually ended up with all of a sudden 99 ones in your wallet. You add another one to it, and you can have 100 ones in your wallet, but it would be much nicer to turn that 100 ones into a $100 bill in terms of space or in terms of a number of bills or something. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take what would have been 59 here and turn it into the number 60. So I want you to imagine what this looks like in terms of the place value. I've got the red place value, and I've got this green, I'll put this green over here, okay, this green place value. So I'm supposed to change this so that I don't have the 59 anymore, because now I have a 60. So I'm actually going to end up with the triangle that was there already and one more triangle, because that gives me two values in the 60s place. I already have one, and now I have an additional one that's in the 60s place. So this would actually be the number 2 times 60, instead of it being 1 times 60 plus 1 times 59. Are you okay with that? Do you sense that there might be a problem? I hope you do, because I've still got a red line with nothing in it. And that red line was my convention. That had nothing to do with the Babylonian. They didn't draw the red line, the green line. So this actually becomes simply the number that looks like this. That numeral from part B could be interpreted as 2 times 60, which is what we mean it to be, which is 120. But it also could be interpreted as 2 times 1. Uh, that's a problem. 
Because I don't know about you, but if somebody owed me $120, I don't want them to think they only owe me two. They don't have a way to represent a zero is the problem, right? They don't have a zero placeholder. We have the same problem in our system if when we had two tens, we wrote the number as two, right, in terms of its value. We don't do that. We can say two tens, zero one, so we have the number 20. Are you with me on this? This is a problem. So even worse, you could interpret this. So back at the very beginning, I sort of cheated a little bit when I was talking with Audrey, and I said, we're going to put this green line right here. And I said, it makes sense to do so because I have these triangles and then I have these less than signs. Well, that's true, and that would be a correct interpretation of a number. Unfortunately, there's nothing that says I have to draw that green line there. There could be an additional green line here. There could be an additional green line, so to speak, at any point in this. Because they also have no way to say, stop counting the ones place and start counting the 60s place. Stop counting the 60s place and start counting the 60s squared. So we could interpret this as 160 and 11. That is, we could think that what we meant to do was this. Oops. Again, they don't have the red and the green things to underline pieces of this, so this is unhelpful from their perspective because they don't mean they don't have um, a, a nice tidy way to differentiate. Um, that seems rather problematic, don't you think? It does to me in terms of bookkeeping and things like that. This is not such a good system. Um, also, the numbers numbers are numerals are cumbersome to write. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I had to count all these when I was telling you how many there were, even for my own paper, and I created the problem, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of symbols there to write the number out, and so it's a little bit messy to write or cumbersome to write. Okay, let's look at another one. The Mayans. Where have you heard the Mayans talk about before? Calendars. Calendars? Mm -hmm. In fact, they had an interesting thing with calendars recently, didn't they? Do you remember what it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they predicted the end of the world, or at least we interpreted that they were predicting based on what they'd done, right? And it was supposed to end in 2012, and yet in 2014, we we're all still living. So I think we're okay. I think we moved past that. Um, so the Mayans have a number system where at least they have a number for zero. So that's one step up of those Babylonians, right? The Babylonians, part of the problem was they had no way to put a zero in that last placeholder system. Well, the, the Mayans do have a placeholder zero. So that's actually the symbol that I'll write last. But they have a symbol for the number one. It's actually a dot. They have a symbol for the number five. It's actually a horizontal line. And they have a symbol for the number zero. And it's a shell. Something like that, anyway. They do have a place value system, like us, like the Babylonians, where they can use these numerals and um, they can make the number bigger by having fewer numerals. Um, it's a modified base 20 system. So what does that mean? Well, again, in our system, we have the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, it's all base tens, right? Um, in their system, oh, let me say also before I write it, it's written vertically. Their lowest value is actually written on bottom, so this is the ones place. The second placeholder is the twenties place. And if they had a true base 20 system, the next one would be 20 squared, and then 20 cubed, 20 to the fourth, right? They don't do that. Um, their next system place value is actually 20 times 18. And just for real quick reference, because we're going to talk about why they did this, what is 20 times 18? 360. Any guesses as to why they might have liked to use 360 instead of what would have been 400? Where do you see 360 used? In a circle, degrees in a circle. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. They were definitely in geometry, so that was part of it. There's something else, too. That's what you said before, Carly. That's almost the number of days a year, isn't it? Awfully close. 360, 365. So yeah, I mean, this is why they're doing it, is this sort of a system that they're recognizing that 360 has significance in our world. Um, and so they used the 360 in this place. So what they did next, though, is then they did powers of 20 after this. So the next one would actually be another times 20. So they'd have 20 squared times that 18. And then they'd have 20 cubed times the 18. And I do not mean these vertical bars to represent the number 
spot. I'm just using like I would a placeholder to tell you there's a spot there, a place there. Um, just for fun, do you know what this one is? 360s, one after 360? Bigger than that. Is it 7200? And then what about this one at the top? Hundred forty-four thousand, just for fun. So the place values get really large too, um, fairly quickly. Now, the way that they do their numbers is that they have bars and they have these dots. And, and if they have a zero, they just put the shell in the place of the zero. That that part's fine. That part works really well actually. Uh, but they do bars and dots. So if they have the number, for instance, um, eight, then it would be a bar for five, and then they put three dots on top. So the dots always go on top of the bar in their system. If you see another location, like let's say we had this, and then we had, I'll use the same color, this is not going to be the number eight anymore, and you had another bar on top of that, then it would have to mean that this is one place value, and this is a second place value, at the very least. So that you had eight down here and you had a five right here. So this would be five twenties. That's two zero S, but let me see if it's gonna be twenty. So it'd be five twenties and this would be eight ones. So we could, we could actually talk about that. This actually works pretty well as long as we're just working with twenties and ones with our dollar bills too. Because we can actually talk about having one dollar bills and five dollar bills, right? And we can talk about having twenty dollar bills. So this would be looking like we had a twenty dollar bill. Uh, I'm sorry, five $20 bills because it's minimum five. We have five $20 bills, and we'd have those dots represent one one in each of them, and then we'd have underneath that another five. Okay. It's a little bit different, but let me talk about what happens then when we look at numbers before and after. Oh, I need to give you that number to look at, don't I? All right, so put two dots and a line, and then four dots and a line. <laughs> All right, so let's identify first something that my students always forget this piece when we get to mine for some reason. Where is the ones place? On the bottom. So if we change a number by increasing or decreasing it by one, it changes what's on the bottom of this vertical distribution, not what's on the top. Okay, so don't go adding or subtracting the dots on the top based on adding or subtracting the number one, because you're using the wrong place value. Right? That would be like paying somebody a $20 bill instead of paying a $1 bill, not a mistake you want to make. Okay? So keep that in mind as you're looking at this, and it's probably a good idea to start with, to remind yourself that this is the 20s place, and this is the ones place. All right, so let's talk about um, the number before. How would I get the number before this one? Take away dot. Right, because the dots are present the number one. If I remove a dot, I will change from having the F at nine down here, because it's a bar and four dots, to having a number eight. So the number before this one actually looks like the same two dots and a line on top, but then I have three dots and a line on bottom. Okay, just take away a dot. Which must mean the other one's the tricky one, right? Because taking away a dot was pretty straightforward. So we would think we would, well, like add a dot, right? But what would happen if we tried to add a dot? Right, then you actually would get five, and the number five is not represented by five, it's represented by a line like Taylor, so that's good. So we have the two dots and the line still here. And then what happens? I have two lines. And this is correct. We didn't do anything wrong. But this is not very good notation. Because now, I can't really draw that red line very convincingly, can I? Not so much. So this number could be read as 7 times 20 plus 10 times 1, which is what we want it to be. That's what we're trying for here. Okay? That's what we intended when we wrote the thing. Uh, but it also could be looked at just as the number 17. Can you see 17 there? Uh-huh. Or it could be looked at as 
13 times 20 plus 5 times 1. Can you see that? If you sort of drew the red line right here, there's 13. Sorry, why did I say 13? I think that should say 12. I'm sorry, that should say 12. 12 there. 12 times 20 and then the 5 on the bottom times the 1. And there's actually other things it could do as well. Right? We could say that this bottom one's in the 1's place, the middle line's in the 20's place, and this line right here is in that 360's place, and the two, two dots on top are in that 7200's place. We really don't have a reason for why we draw that red line very well. Now, I knew I had to draw the red line that I drew up here. That's no question, because dots turn into lines. And we always have dots above lines. So this one had to be drawn there. But could I have drawn additional red lines somewhere? There's nothing that says I couldn't. And that's a problem. This doesn't work very well. Agreed? Yeah. Not so good. Yes, I agree. You don't, it, it's not like, see, what we would really like to have is we'd really kind of like to have a comma, wouldn't we? We'd be kind of like to have a comma or something that has that effect. The problem with the zero that they have at a shelf is it actually means there's zero of something. So if I put a zero in, it means there's zero 20s. Well, I don't have zero 20s. I'm really supposed to have seven 20s, and I'm supposed to have a 10. So this isn't good, right? This is not good. Yeah, so the shell actually solves some stuff that Babylonians did, but it doesn't actually solve everything. All right, last one that we're going to take a look at today is the Roman enumeration system. Um, I think this is last one yeah, uh, The Roman enumeration system is a really um, useful system. It's useful enough anyway that we still see it used today. So, somebody tell me somewhere you see Roman numerals used today. What's that? The Super Bowl, yes, you do. Where else? Yeah, you will see it used on volumes of books. What else? Outlines. Clocks, you betcha. Think of any others? Sequels like on movies. <laughs> you can sometimes see it with movies. Or sequels on um, people's last names, right? The first, the second, the third, you know, little Johnny, whatever. And apparently they pick them the better names, which you guys did again. You guys were talking about it. I wrote it did it. Um, yeah, so we, we see them used today. Uh, we don't see them used quite as frequently as we get down this table into the larger values. Uh, but I will say that I had a brother-in-law who got married in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it's a very uh, old, established area from the United States, right? So we get to the Washington, D.C. area. And the building that they were getting married in um, was actually the church where, Wa where George Washington was buried in the courtyard or something like that. It's a Presbyterian church. Um, and the established day on the building was a new Burger Bay. So that was actually somewhere that I thought, well, oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that one. Um, so some of these you know because they're small values that we see used still frequently, and some of them you might not. So what's the first Roman numeral that you guys remember? It looks like an I, yeah. And you can either see it written like that, or sometimes you'll see it written with the toppers, right? So I'm not going to write them with the tops because your book tends not to, but if you want to write them that way, that's fine. What value is that? One. Do you remember the next value? The B, yeah. And what's the B word? Five. What's the next value? X. X is worth ten. And after that is where we see them used less frequently, right? Do you remember? Does anybody know what comes next? Nope. We'll get to see in a minute. It's an L next. L is worth fifty. C is next, however, Taylor, and C is worth a hundred. Mm -hmm. worth 500 and then they have one more M worth a thousand now one of the things you might be looking at and saying is well what if the number is bigger than a thousand well they have a way to handle that too so we will definitely take a look at their way to handle that issue um, let's first talk about the first feature that you are very comfortable and familiar with one of the properties they have is a subtractive property um, so, kind of like um, looking back at both the Egyptians 
and Babylonians, and to some extent the Mayans, but not quite as much, they wrote a lot of symbols, right? And to write out the number, like for the Egyptians, it was 999 or something, right? A lot of symbols, 27 symbols to do that, right? Well, the Romans took care of that. And so when they took care of that, they did a subtractive feature. So to avoid repeating a symbol more than three times, they would actually write a symbol in front of it to indicate subtraction. So instead of writing I, 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 they would write it as I, B. Okay, not the one that goes in your arm when you're sick in the hospital. Okay, I, B. When a smaller number symbol is written before the larger number symbol, that's when you see this property taking place. However, only a symbol one value smaller can be written before a symbol that's larger. So in particular, this only applies to fives and nines. So let me tell you what I mean by that. It would be really nice if I could write the number 99 as, in essence, 100 minus 1. That is, if I could write the number 1 and then C. They do not do that in their system. Okay? They don't. It's only one place value less than what they're working with. So if we were to write the number 99 down here, I'm sorry, I already skipped the 90. If we wanted to write the number 99, we actually have to treat it as the 90 and as the 9, because those are different place values. So let's go back to 90 and talk about how we do 90. Well, 90 could be written, how could 90 be written as a subtractive feature? 100 minus 10. Uh, and that makes sense, because we're actually looking at, again, one place value less. So we've got the number 100, that's three digits. We've got the number 10, that's two digits. One place value less. So 99, we can write the number 100, which is C. And then what's the number for 10? The numeral for 10. It's an X, and we write the X before. So since the smaller one comes before the larger one, that's the subtraction feature going on. And that's the number 90. So we have X, C. If it were CX, it would be the number 110. Okay, so the order of these really matters. Now, so if we wanted to do 99, well, we just said how we did the number 90. We would do X, C, and then we'd do the number 9. And how would we do the number 9? I, X. Yes. We need those symbols. Yes, we need I and then X. And we want the I to come in front because it's the smaller one that tells us, hey, there's a subtraction going on. Are you guys with me? So we can't just use any symbol in front of another one and need subtraction. There are certain ones that happen. And 9 and 4 are the only ones that we see happen. They have one other issue in their system that's interesting and unique to them. The multiplicative property. So the multiplicative property, we'll, we'll stop here, but just let me just tell you, it's how we get the numbers to be bigger than a thousand. Okay? So we'll talk about that. Here's your one piece of homework for the weekend. If you've already done this for me once before in another class, keep your mouth shut and give everybody else a chance. I want you at some point during your weekend to go look at the clock on top of Brady's Chapel and tell me what's wrong with it. When you come back to class on Monday. What's wrong with the clock on top of Brady's Chapel? Okay? Have a great weekend, guys.